Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in the playlist on learning and memory. In this video, what we're going to talk about is habituation, which is a form of non-associative uh, procedural learning. Okay, so habituation. Right, so firstly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with uh, a discussion of uh, what procedural learning is, uh, what non-associative procedural learning is, and then uh, what habituation is. Uh, then what we'll do is we'll discuss some basic common sense examples of habituation, and then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the gill withdrawal reflex and habituation of the gill withdrawal reflex in Aplysia californica. Okay, and I'll explain all of that when we come to it. Right, uh, and then finally, we'll actually see a neural mechanism for this habituation in uh, the gill withdrawal reflex in Aplysia californica. Okay, right. So firstly, let's start off with what procedural uh, learning is. Well, procedural learning is quite difficult to actually define, but it's a very robust form of learning. Okay, so basically it is an alteration to motor responses to stimuli. So usually what happens is you get some sort of sensory stimulus and then what occurs is some sort of motor response, okay? And basically procedural learning involves changing the motor response that you initiate to um, this stimuli, basically. Okay, that's kind of what procedural learning is. Uh, it's a very, very robust form of learning. Okay, generally once you have learned something uh, and it's within procedural learning, then you don't forget it, okay? It's not like declarative memory, which is, for instance, being able to remember who was the monarch of England in 1625 or something. That's very easy to forget. It's a very non-robust form of memory, whereas procedural memory, all that we would count as procedural memory is the sort of things that you would never forget, like riding a bike or driving, things like that that are ingrained into you forever once you've learnt them. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, procedural learning can be divided into two forms. Associative procedural learning, which is where you uh, learn to associate to stimuli or potentially a uh, behaviour, a motor response to a stimuli. So it's where you learn to associate two things. And then non-associative procedural learning, which involves only one stimulus, basically. So this is non-associative uh, procedural learning. So habituation is a form of non-associative procedural learning, which just involves one stimulus. So let me now tell you what habituation is. Okay, so basically, uh, habituation uh, is where you have some stimulus that is unimportant. Okay, so some unimportant stimulus, and you're being exposed to this unimportant stimulus on a repeated basis, basically. So you're being exposed repeatedly to this unimportant stimulus. Now, maybe initially, you would have initiated some response to this unimportant stimulus. But gradually what you're going to do is, as you learn that this unimportant stimulus doesn't matter, you're going to reduce your response to it. So this is what habituation is about. It's about reducing the response which you produce to an unimportant stimulus. Okay? Right, so let me give you some examples of it, some common sense examples of it. Okay, so, for instance, if you um, sleep with a clock, okay, uh, you don't hear that clock, okay, you never, well, you don't pay any attention to it, you do hear it, of course, uh, it, the sound is still there, it's coming into your ears, but you don't actually, you're not consciously aware of hearing that clock, you don't pay any attention to it, okay, so it's as though it is not there, whereas, if someone who sleeps in a room without a clock in it suddenly goes to sleeping in a room with a clock, the clock will disturb them, basically. They'll be hearing the clock all night, basically, okay, uh, because they're not used to it. However, if they stay in that room, you know, if they sleep in that room repeatedly for a few nights, then after a while, they too will habituate to the sound of the clock. 
they will learn that that is an unimportant stimulus, that it doesn't mean anything, okay, and you, you don't need to uh, pay attention to it, you don't need to initiate a response to it, okay, so uh, you will gradually stop initiating the response to it, and they too will be able to have a peaceful night's sleep. Okay, right, so that's a common sense example of habituation, that you gradually learn not to pay attention to the clock uh, tick-tock sound. Okay, right, another example is if I um, squirt a puff of air onto your eye, okay, so let me sh show an eye here, so here's an eye, okay, viewed from the side, and I'm going to squirt a puff of air onto the eye, okay, and it's not noxious or anything, it's not going to cause any sort of pain, okay? Initially, of course, when you first have this done, you will blink, okay? Now, if you repeat this, if you have it done multiple times, eventually you will learn that it does not deliver any sort of pain, basically, and you're, you will stop initiating the response, you will stop blinking, basically. That's an example of habituation. Okay, right. So, now what we're going to see is an example of habituation in a different species, in a non-human species. Okay, and this non-human species is going to be a Plisia californica. Okay, now Plisia californica is basically a sea slug. Okay, so let me draw a picture of what one of these looks like. Okay, so basically, they have a rather unusual structure. They have a sort of protrusion of their back, which we'll come back to in a moment like so, and I would recommend that you have a pic look at a picture of one of these. They are big things, okay? Uh, they, um, they're around five inches long, so they're big, big slugs, okay? And they live within the sea, okay? So five inches. Right, uh, so, a Plisia californica is a form of sea slug. Now, you might be wondering, why on earth is he talking about sea slugs? Well, basically, a lot of these uh, neuroscientific experiments into procedural learning, into the neural mechanisms of procedural learning, have been done in Aplysia californica. Now, let me try and give you some motivation for this. Okay, so that I can try and convey everyone else's excitement over Aplysia californica to you. Basically, the human brain contains a hundred billion neurons. So let me write that out in actual numbers. So a hundred billion. So there we go. That's a hundred billion neurons. So you have a huge number of neurons within the human brain. Okay? Each of these neurons can have around 10,000 connections to other neurons. The complexity there is incomprehensible. Okay, we are nowhere near understanding how the human brain works on the whole level. Okay, um, whereas Aplysia californica has a mere 20,000 neurons. Okay, and these neurons are massive. Okay, so they're much bigger than human neurons, which makes them quite easy to do electrophysiological analysis on. So, it is plausible that we could actually understand completely the nervous system of a Plisia californica, okay? Whereas it is incomprehensible, it's not plausible that we can at the moment understand uh, the human brain, basically. So that is why we have moved from studying humans to studying a Plisia californica, because it's actually doable, basically. Now you might say, but, you know, you're not going to be able to find the neural correlate of emotion, or of motivation, or of uh, thought, uh, or of consciousness in one of these, okay? However, that may be true, but however, Aplysia californica does display certain forms of procedural memory. Specifically, it does show habituation, okay? And the nervous system here is much simpler, so we might be able to understand the neural correlate of habituation on the, for Aplysia californica, whereas we might not be able to find it for humans because of the complexity of the human nervous system. Okay, so that is the motivation for why we are going 
from studying humans to studying these Aplysia californica. And this is, you know, neuroscientists love these things, okay? Right, so, now I want to tell you about the form of habituation that occurs within these sea slugs. Okay, so basically there is something called the gill withdrawal reflex for these uh, Aplysia californica. Okay, and to show you this, I need to uh, show you uh, what the Aplysia californica looks like from a different angle. So what I now want to do is look from above down at an Aplysia californica. Okay, so basically what you have is, this is its front bit here, okay, and then it has its little sensor things here. Okay, there we go. Uh, right, and now it has this protrusion that comes out up here. Okay, so I'll draw that at the top here, like so. Okay, and then we also have this little bit coming out the back here, its little tail. Right, so this is what Aplysia californica looks like from above. And basically there's a very special structure in this portion here, in this protrusion upwards, okay? So basically, what you have is something that is known as the siphon, okay? Which I'm colouring now in, in red. Okay, so this portion in, uh, in red, sorry, here, represents the siphon, okay? And then this other portion here, which I'll colour in in green, uh, this represents the gill. Okay, and basically the gill withdrawal reflex is that if you squirt some water onto the siphon, what occur happens is the gill will retract basically and it will cover, it will move backwards over the siphon basically. So this is effectively a little sort of flap of muscle and basically what can happen is it can flap over the siphon, so if it contracts it will contract and flap over the siphon, okay, and cover the siphon, protecting it. So basically, if you bring in your little pipette here and squirt some water onto the siphon, what happens is that uh, this Aplysia californica here will undergo the gill withdrawal reflex and basically the gill will flap back over the siphon to protect it. Okay, so basically the form of habituation that this um, Aplysia californica shows is that if you do this repeatedly, so if you, um, you continue repeating this experiment, so you bring in your pipette, you squirt the water onto the siphon, uh, the gill retracts over the siphon to protect it, then you wait a while for the gill to uh, return to its original position, then you come in with your pipette again, squirt the cold water, and the gill uh, withdraws again over the siphon, and you repeat this again and again and again. Eventually, the amount of contraction that you get within the gill reduces each time, even though the stimulus remains exactly the same, okay? And eventually, it will stop doing it altogether, so it habituates to the stimulus of having the water sprayed onto the siphon, basically. It learns that that is an unimportant stimulus and that it doesn't need to uh, perform the response of withdrawing the gill, okay? So it extinguishes that response, and that's a form of habituation. So, what we want to now do is look at the neural correlate of this. We want to see how did this actually occur, i.e. what changes occurred to the neurocircuitry uh, that governs this um, gill withdrawal reflex that then caused this form of habituation, which is this form of procedural learning. Okay, right. So, we'll start in the next video by looking at the neural circuitry that governs the gear withdrawal reflex, and then we'll look at um, what modifications have occurred to that uh, circuitry uh, to produce you the habituated response.